Good morning, everybody. Um, just a quick story. Uh, so I actually was a former BI community participant about 10 years ago with another company called Way In. Um, at uh, I was the last one I was at I think was uh, the South by Southwest in like 2014. But good to be back as a part of the community here. And I, I do have a 40 under 40 brand innovator with me. Um, no longer 40. Oh. <laughs> no longer 40. They're not still not on. <laughs> but uh, but I just wanted to um, start out. So in in full transparency, what I what I did is to make sure that I was doing a fireside chat correctly. I, I looked up some tactics that they said to follow. So I wanted it to be engaging, and so. They said, hey, look up and see um, some personal facts about somebody that you're interviewing. So it could be a little bit more extemporaneous and, and not planned. So, you know, first thing I do is like Google Alan McGee. And I'm thinking, okay, there's going to be like all sorts of information about Alan McGee. And, and the first thing I see is a, is a uh, World, War, World War II pilot. Okay, so if, if anybody knows this story, please stop me. But there was a World War II pilot named Alan McGee who was shot down basically by German flak, and his parachute uh, was not working. Uh, so then as he was going back to the, uh, the bomb bay, he like got ejected from the plane with no parachute, no nothing, and fell 22,000 feet to the ground and survived. Um, he, he like crashed through a glass top of a train station and survived. So I thought, as my icebreaker, okay, so that takes a lot of resilience and, and bouncing back um, from an experience like that. So I thought I'd ask Alan, whether it's personally or in your career, what is something you've done to kind of bounce back from a hardship or a near-death experience, if that's crossed your, your path? I've had a couple near-death experiences from a marketing side, for sure. Definitely uh, in my agency days, trafficking the, the wrong creative and then the client seeing it. Um, you know, that was the very first near-death experience where I thought I was getting fired. And then I was told, it's okay, we'll just go change it tomorrow. Not a big deal. Um, so that's always the first one that comes to mind. It's like every mistake is fixable. Well, well played there. Um, so just I, I just want to share like a little bit of an introduction um, and I'll let you kind of share the real thing. But, uh, you know, Alan, Alan and I met yesterday as, as a pre-call, uh, spent a lot of time at different brands here in Atlanta, uh, Church's Chicken, IHG, Arby's, uh, Focus Brands, I think you've hit up most of them here. Uh, but yeah, just feel free to share a little bit more about yourself and then we'll get going. Yeah, I've been in Atlanta for almost 20 years now. I've uh, made my way around a, a lot of uh, the big brand houses here, I'd say. Um, so, but in the last year, I joined this company, Empire Portfolio Group, um, making the switch from the franchisor to the franchisee side of the business. So Empire, as you can see, DBA of Orange City Fitness. Who's been to an Orange City Fitness in this room? Oh, I love it. How many are still members? Okay, that, that tracks. <laughs> you all will be getting emails shortly about, about a win back campaign to come back soon. Uh, but we are the second largest OTF franchise group. Uh, so we're headquarters out of New York, but we have uh, about 11 different areas, everywhere from Maine down to the Carolinas, with about 150 studios under our remit. We own, operate, and have sub-franchisees. So we're actually, a, if you compare us to a lot of brands, we're actually bigger than a lot of brands, just based on revenue, based on people, based on count. So, um, so we really count ourselves as a brand. Um, so OTF is our first brand. We're adding more to our wellness portfolio as we move down the next uh, next couple of years. But I came in about a year ago to lead marketing, communications, creative. There was no marketing team, so it was a build from the ground up. Um, so anything and everything that relates to it really falls to me and, and my small team, which is which is pretty fun. Thank you, Alan. And just a quick context on me. So. Um... As I mentioned, I was at a previous company for my last uh, tour of duty with BI, but uh, I'm, I'm the head of the U.S. market for Stravito. So, uh, John, you did say that correctly. We're uh, Swedish, so uh, I think your, your pronunciation was right on there, Stravito. Uh, so we're based in Stockholm, and uh, we, I heard the, the uh, Carter team talk a lot about you know, insights. And so essentially what we do is we help 
companies like Delta, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's here uh, locally, and, and, and they spend a lot of money on market research and insights. Uh, but when they come into the organization, it's usually through like a PowerPoint or a PDF or a Tableau dashboard. And so we allow uh, companies to organize all that through a Google-like search experience and a Spotify, Netflix personalization so that everybody has access to vetted insights to innovate their brands. So uh, just wanted to start off, um, and excuse me, I'm using my phone as my teleprompter. Um, so the first topic we wanted to cover is around um, Alan went from getting people to consume calories at churches and Arby's and Moe's and others to now burning them. And so just tell us a little bit about the parallels between you know, the QSR worlds or some of your other industry experiences now into you know, health and fitness. Yeah, I, I get this question a lot. Everyone's like, how'd you go from trying to feed people these 3,000 calorie fried chicken meals to now trying to get them to say you should eat healthy and, and work out five days a week, right? Um, but from a marketing side, there's so many parallels. Like there's the 80% that all tracks the same. If you think about from the food world, right, you've got so many options that are out there. You've got, you know, probably eight to 10 brands. When you're thinking about where should I have dinner tonight in my consideration set, you're maybe thinking pizza or sandwich or Italian or whatever, right? And you're making decisions based on this. So as a brand, you've got to cut through the clutter, cut through the noise like they just talked about. And you've got to always have some new product, some, you know, some way of staying in front of the customer. It's the exact same way from the fitness world. Um, I like to, to say, you know, five years ago when Orange Theory was still an up and coming brand, like you could plop one down and people would just run to it. They just came to it, right? Because it was Orange Theory, or you're going to a big box, LA Fitness, or, or Planet Fitness. Well, the world has really changed now. Probably half this room has a Peloton subscription. You've probably been to other classes, all these other boutique classes, like an F45 or a burn boot camp or a, a, a bar class, right? The space is super crowded now. So the fitness space looks a lot like the restaurant space. You've got your big box gyms, which are kind of like your fast food, like, you know, paying your $9.99 a month. They don't care if you ever show up. That's fine. They collect their check. You've got your higher elevated boutique fitness, like an orange theory, where we're more expensive on a monthly basis, but we actually want you to come and we want to, we want to retain you. And so for us, it's about we've got to stay top of mind. We've got to break through that clutter. And we have to describe, like, what is orange theory? Because a lot of people don't understand what it is. Am I coming in? Am I running on a treadmill? Is this a boot camp? What's this rower about? Why do I have to buy a heart rate monitor, right? There's a, there's a lot of steps in this. And so a lot is helping people understand is what is the brand proposition and how are we different and then getting them in to actually experience it, just like a food brand. Like can show you, you know, a sandwich that looks appealing, but there's a number of things that are going to come into that equation that get you to come in and try it. And once you've tried it, I've done my job and now it's up to getting you to become a repeat purchaser. So media-wise, Actually, creative-wise, um, social, there's like a lot of stuff that's so similar that it all carry o carries over from really the, the food world because everyone's just still the same consumer. It doesn't matter if you're thinking about where am I going to work out or where am I going to eat, you're still thinking in the same mindset. Thank you. Uh, so next, I wanted to cover, we, we did a pre-call, talked a little bit about Orange Theories relative to The Bachelor. So that, that's your teaser. Um, so, so wanted to cover this topic of you know, the, the customer journey. And you know, this is all about digital today, but we talked a little bit about the intertwinings between digital and physical, especially something like fitness that, you know, given the last three years, we know it's turned more digital, but a lot of people like myself still like to be in person and sweat it out uh, with a group of people. So um, so tell us, yeah, just a little bit about this bachelor analogy. Yeah, so a, a big part of my job is working with our studio managers and they're non-marketers. So it's explaining marketing to non-marketers on a, on a daily basis. So I just have to find really fun, creative ways to kind of break through because I'll be explaining media and this channels and it's just like a glaze over their head. Like, I don't get this. Just tell me how many leads am I getting in? this week, right? What's my, what's my lead rate? So when you think about Orange Theory, it's experience-based. So 
digital plays a really big role in this, but the physical and digital experience for fitness is really intertwined. So we talk about, if you think about you, if you think about our studios, it's like The Bachelor. Our studios, along with the competition, are the contestant for The Bachelor. Ultimately, what we want to get to is the final rose where they become a member that loves our brand. And so how's The Bachelor start, right? The limo pulls up and everyone gets out and they do something you know, really absurd to try to break through the noise, right? That's where it starts. So as a brand, you've got to break through the noise. That's where media, that's where creative, that's where all of that comes through, making you top of mind. The very first thing you've got to do. Next, what else happens on the first night of The Bachelor? Right, you've got your little happy hour. And ultimately what you want to happen is you want to then get into their consideration set. The Bachelor's looking at 20 different people. He's talking to all of them. They all run together, no matter what the brand name is. So you've got to break through. What you want is for, is to say, hey, can I steal you for a second? And that's what we're trying to do digitally. And so it's around, what's the first thing you do as a consumer? You go look up reviews. You go look up pictures, right? You do your research. This is all research that's happening outside of the studio. And so reviews, images, your social media feed, all of that needs to be focused on getting people to the next stage of as a prospect. And a lot of people don't think about that. They just think it's, let me see the ad and let me show up in the gym and let me close them. No, but there's like three to four steps that have to, you have to get someone there. Ultimately, as you get through those stages, the competition starts to dwindle down a little bit more and it's around that then building an emotional connection. And that's where your digital channels, I would say our social channels, build an emotional connection with someone before they ever step foot in a studio. Because you look at an Instagram grid and you want to know, are there people that look like me? Are there people like me? Can I do this workout? Overcoming all those objections before they actually even step foot into a studio to have that conversation. Because it could be scary, and a lot of people will say, I'm out before I even have had a conversation to see is this something that I can do. And then ultimately, once you, once you get them to become a member, it's about how do you turn them from like to love. So someone can come in, buy a membership, they like Orange Theory, but what we want them to do is love it. And like to love is not an A to B process. It's if you ever watch The Bachelor, you, you see these contestants like, I really think I'm liking you. Um, I think I'm starting to have feelings for you. I think, I'm, I, I think I'm falling in love with you. So there's about four to five steps before you get to, I love you. And that's ultimately what we want to do. We don't want people to come in and say, I really like you, but now 90 days later, uh, I don't think I like you anymore and, and I'm out. So it's about getting from that like to love. And ultimately that's what gets us the final rose. So um, I always think it's just a fun analogy. Also talk about how you own your hometown in there when uh, you go on hometown visits and own your local community. So there's all these different analogies to try to explain marketing to our non-marketers, but it shows the, the combination of digital and physical and it's, there's no line between them. They all work together and you can't just say, we're just gonna do this over here and do this over here. You've gotta think about it all as one journey because we're complex people, and we, as consumers, think about it as one journey. Great perspective, Alan. Uh, so another thing uh, to bring our worlds together, you know, mine and kind of the insights, research, and, and yours in digital marketing, how, how do you look at insights and kind of voice of customer, all the buzzwords we talk about, and incorporate that into it, especially with you know, a lot of 120-plus you know, franchisees? How do, you, how do you kind of take the voice of your clientele and incorporate that into how you're marketing and how you're you know, planning for the future. Yeah, we, we use insights a lot and it's a combination of big national research insights and then at the local studio insights. And I'd say the biggest thing is understanding what, where does the brand sit in our consumer's mind and then what is that perception and what are those hurdles? And the biggest ones that we run into a lot that come, that come up constantly are understanding what the workout is and then is this, this workout is too difficult for me. So people have made those two decisions from insights before they've ever stepped foot into one of our studios. So how do we overcome that from a creative, from a messaging perspective, from a sales perspective? 
we just launched a brand new ad campaign and actually it's the first one in a few years that actually shows the workout. So it's like sometimes just simplifying, um, going back to the basics, that's what the insights really told us we need to do and that's what we've been doing and that's what is helping us, I'd say help our creative work a lot harder just this year. That's great. Uh, what about, so I know this is a common question, but I do think it's important given you know, your role economic environment uh so obviously i know they say a lot of times you know the first thing to go sometimes is the gym membership um or just you know the post-pandemic world of people having a lot of different options what do you see as some of the biggest challenges and threats that you need to navigate to make sure that you keep on the growth path that you need yeah i'd say in in fitness um the biggest challenge is retainment so a lot of people will come into the top of the funnel, they become members, but now you have so many options out there. And most people have two to three options. You probably have a Peloton subscription at home. You probably also work out at this gym over here and you also have something else. So people are able to toggle a lot easier to go over to the various options. So the biggest challenge that, we try to over, that we're trying to overcome is making sure that our experience is standing out. You're building an emotional connection with the coaches that you're working with, you're understanding the science behind it, seeing those results um, versus those where you, you're going and working out on your own or it's a purely digital experience with Peloton. So it's really comes down to the experience at a studio is the is that big differentiator right now. What about, so I, I saw you had about 120 um, franchisees. Do you have plans or what are plans to grow that? Uh, I know you're only on the East Coast, but just tell us a little bit about you know growth plans and how digital plays into that. Yeah, we're we're definitely growing. Um, our group has opened up ten new studios. Um, we're one of the fastest growing groups in the last I'd say four months. A lot of that growth in New England, um, Charlotte. We've opened up five new studios in Charlotte in the last six months. So there's still a lot of white space in the fitness in the fitness world. Um, also, as we're seeing other brands that are closing their doors, then we're reopening, then we're opening up new doors in those markets. So there's still high, high demand because wellness overall, people care more about their wellness and trying to uh, impact their health age much more than ever before. And so the demand's there. It's just making sure that we're getting the, putting the supply there. Um, but we're focused on, we're still filling out a lot of white space on the East Coast. Um, and... I'd say in the middle of the country, there's still a lot of growth on the West Coast, um, not so much. Okay. There's a lot of talk um, about you know the generational gaps between the, in the workforce and so forth. So I, I saw from doing my research um, on, on your background, you know, board of directors of the UGA digital marketing program, a lot of investment in the future marketers. So what, what are you teaching you know, the up and comers about digital marketing and, and kind of how are you investing in them to make sure that they're on stage as the brand innovators in 2030? Uh, I, I love working with uh, university students. I do a lot with UGA and my alma mater Clemson in their marketing departments. Um, a lot of what I, I talk with them and work with them on are, are competitions um, and a little bit of in-class work. But <laughs> I'd say the, the big thing is, is really strategic thinking outside of just a textbook and how to think about um, what are you applying here that are the basics, but how does that actually apply into the real world? But then the other biggest one that I really focus a lot of time on with them is, uh, is presenting skills. And it's like, you can be as smart as you, as you want, but you've gotta be able to take these 10 things and drill it down to one point. How can you, I always challenge them saying, you've gotta give me a one pager. Like you only have one page to work with, you don't get five slides. And so those type of things of trying to cultivate that early on so when they get to the workforce, then they're already thinking that way about how to communicate. I think that's one of the biggest gaps in our education system, especially for marketing, is quite frankly communication, that our young marketers coming out are not strong communicators, which is funny because marketing is, a, you know, is communication. Okay, just a couple more like rapid fire, fun, fun things. I listed off all the brands that you worked for. So let's start with Arby's favorite menu item. Oh, I uh, curly fries, easy. Moe's. Queso. Best hotel experience at ISG. 
Oh, wow. Best hotel experience. Best. Uh, Intercontinental Montreal. Okay. Can you elaborate? Uh, it's just, it's just a, it's, it's a very old school um, Intercontinental Hotel. It just has really, really old charm to it, traditional. Um, so I, I don't know, that one just always sticks out to me. Like, I'm a sucker for Montreal in general. I don't know why. And then uh, Church's Chicken. So easy. If you haven't had Church's Chicken Biscuit, I mean, don't, don't sleep on it. <laughs> so, so, much, so much better than, you know, Popeye's, KFC, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> oh, James, yes. I, I, I will stand behind the Church's uh, Biscuit all day long. Yeah, yeah, the chicken, the chicken wars are real here in Atlanta. Okay. All right, one, one more, and then I do, I do want to give the audience a chance to participate um, and, and switch the mic to them. But one more thing is we talked about, you know, investing in the next generation, but also we have such a great group of people in the room, a lot of peers, a lot of people that have a lot of experience. So when you're kind of stuck or you need a brainstorm, who are you seeking out as, as peers in digital marketing or in, in innovation? And then... What are some of the resources, whether it's you know podcasts or books or, or things that we can all uh, look to for inspiration? Uh, brand innovators, for sure. I'm going to try to get to as many of these events as, as possible, be able to hear what is new, what's going on. Um, but I truly believe in networking. I probably do at least one virtual coffee a week with somebody that's in a marketing role, usually digital, um, at some other brand. It could be something that's totally irrelevant, but I'm always like, who are you working with? What media are you doing? What are you doing for this? And like one coffee a week, I learned so much and I brought in so many new partners or like little tactics that I could steal. Um, so yeah, I, I just firmly believe in just consistent networking. You can't just do it for six months and then stop. You just have to like keep plugging away at it every single week. Great. Okay, what questions do you, I, I've exhausted mine. What questions do you have for Ellen? something you said sparked this question. How important do you think it is to live the brand that you're working for? So you're, you work for fast food and now you're working for fitness. And I'm also kind of curious which you feel more connected to or maybe both. Um, I, I think it's pretty important to live the brand that you're, that you're working for. I was an OTF member for five years prior to, to this role. And so wellness and fitness is super important to me. And that was a space that I seeked out. Um, but i you know, food is food is a challenging one. You've gotta you've gotta love the food and you've gotta um, believe in the food. But it, in my point of view, like doesn't mean that you have to eat the food every single day. Thank you. From uh, TikTok, I'm just curious when you're thinking about your targeting audience, are you looking to convert fitness people who are already interested in fitness? But yeah, or are you interested in converting people who weren't necessarily looking at fitness? A, a little bit of both. Um, the you know the closer in circle is people that are already working out. They're already in fitness. They just want to. They just want another option. They want to change it up, right? Um, the biggest segment, which is the eighty percent, is people that aren't working out today. People that haven't worked out in two or three years, and they're like, I need to feel better. I want to work out, but I don't know how. Someone needs to tell me how to do it. Um, so. My, a lot of what I'm targeting is people that haven't worked out or that aren't working out, but there's many more hurdles we've got to get over with them, but that is such a huge audience. All right, there we go. Uh, build up. Thank you for this. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned uh, retention as being a big challenge. So can you talk a little bit about how you manage both your media mix, social, email, video, you mentioned it, and creative, but also the frequency? Like, are you starting to, we hear this from marketers all the time, like, you want to be getting in front of your customers, but you don't want to annoy the shit out of them, right? And I think with your creative, which I've seen is great, how do you manage that where you're getting them, you're getting the interest, but you're not overburdening them and annoying them? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, especially around studios, because 
a lot of markets, we might have studios that are within 10 minutes, you know, 10 minutes of each other. So it's very hyper local where we're really marketing inside of like a mile or two mile radius, which makes it really tight to continue to hammer people with this impressions, the same people over and over and over again. Um, some of that's just changing up the media mix. So like, I probably change up the media mix more than I should, where I'll go two months really strong on video channels, then I'll take two months and go really strong on meta, and I just continue to shake that up versus just using the same channels because targeting can sometimes get limited in there. Um, and then I'd say the, the other thing too is, is really our flexing the spend too. So where we've got seasonality in Q1, this is where we're gonna get 60% of our membership in Q1. So we're gonna hit people with a lot of impressions and then it's gonna scale down. So as, after we get out of Q1, it's not as much of an issue for us as it is We've been, I've been dealing with these three months. Hello. Um, so I'm Angela. I currently work with Marriott, but I was with an Nokia franchise or before this as well. So we can connect <laughs> on the sidebar. But um, I want to hear more about your studio opening plan um, and kind of what you did, what channels you used, and then also how you worked with OTS corporate that was always something that was a little bit tricky on my side too. So I just love to hear um, that from the two. Yeah, it's 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 always tricky, mm -hmm. franchise or a franchisee relationship. Um, from from a, a studio opening plan for marketing, um, we we have a, a, a lot on awareness, probably about four to five months out. So whether it's streaming, it's it's meta, we're just trying to drive drive those impressions in there, um, and then. I really have you up to spend really about the 60 to 90 days pre-opening and bring in some more channels in there, um, start to drive more PR. We brought in social influencers to a lot of just driving awareness. Um, so it, it's, I say it's not anything that's revolutionary, to be honest. Some markets um, go faster than, than others. It's really purely market-based. Um, we brought in Google, so we brought in doing paid search, a lot of Google Display Network. Um, we're going to be start testing with some TikTok on some uh, later this year. So uh, nothing, nothing revolutionary to be honest. Um, just I say steady and like an ebb and flow and changing channels up during that pre-sale time period to keep it fresh. What do you mean? It's a combination. Um, so we roll out programs across all studios. Um, we give them assets. We give them tools. We train in the, train the individual studio managers every every month when there's new ones coming in. Um, and then we work with the regional teams. So for instance, 15 studios in Charlotte, we're also looking at what is additional local activation in Charlotte. We're looking at studio by studio, media mix, and, and regionally. Um, so it's a, it's a little combination because for us, a market like New York and Manhattan operates very differently than Burlington, Vermont, than Charlotte. So we really operate them like about seven different markets because the dynamics are so different between every market of what we do media, what you can do local activation, and also just the strength of the teams we have in those markets. market to market with the way that your customers and potential customers are interacting uh, that you feel the need to change up your marketing strategy? Um, so for instance, from a market to market, like in New York, where, we're, where we have um, a much tighter radiuses, it's, there's much more organic growth in New York. We can spend we can spend a lot less for a lot fewer impressions. We don't have to drive awareness in certain markets. So some markets where we have a strong brand presence, we don't have to drive as much awareness. We can be much more low, lower funnel with our media tactics and still and drive more leads for less. Other markets where have less brand awareness and actually less competition, like for instance, New Hampshire, we don't have a whole lot of competition, but it's 
much more challenging from a marketing perspective because we're marketing fitness. So some markets we've got to market fitness, some markets we have to market the brand. And I think that's the big differentiator of a little bit of um, between what the mix is and how we how we change it up and how we how we use those channels. Anyone else? Right, I expect to see everybody at the six fifteen <laughs> Orange Theory class in Buckhead tomorrow morning. <laughs> Give them my hand. <laughs>